Hi, Martin Turner here. In this video, we focus on a way of viewing business and on accounting rules. We look at what you had to say in the pre-unit survey and then look at double entry accounting. We look at the entity concept and why we use debits and credits and enter everything in twice in accounting. We then look at the accounting equation and the five elements of accounting. Also, we look at the accounting rules, accounting standards and accrual accounting. Let's start by looking at what you had to say in our pre-unit survey. Well, welcome everyone. Um, my name's Martin Turner and I'm your unit coordinator for Act 11059, Accounting, Learning and Online Communication. And uh, in week one, a number of people discovered that there was not just accounting, but also learning and online communication in our unit. And we emphasised learning, particularly last week, and uh, a little bit of accounting and also online communication. Today we'll be a little bit of learning, but mainly accounting, as we look at the way of viewing business. We'll be looking at how accounting is a way of viewing business. And we'll also be looking, just very briefly, at the accounting rules. And as we study accounting this term, we'll realise there are a lot of rules in accounting. And quite a lot of people are settling into the unit. Quite a few people are excited about studying accounting. A number of people were excited about studying accounting before they started the unit. And, uh, um, and so quite a lot of people have started to get engaged into the unit. And uh, so if that's you, that's great. If you're still settling in, um, there's still plenty of time. There's uh, still never more weeks. Also, we have our Peerwise addicts, that's something. I've got a number of peerwise addicts in the unit, as happens, and uh, that's all good. Repetition is part of learning, so peerwise can be very good for reviewing the material in the readings. So there's quite a few people, well, quite a lot of action there, and uh, so there's a couple of quotes from students. And I've been enjoying reading what people have said in their assignment one, step ones, as well, and uh, I've marked probably 60% of everyone's step one. So we're going to look at the pre-unit survey briefly. Uh, I enjoy reading through. I sort of print it off, read people, read everyone's comments on the um, on the uh, um, that they said to various things. It's, it's all very interesting, and I'll give you a bit of a summary of that. Uh, we'll then look at a way of viewing business. We'll look at double entry accounting, the entity concept. The entity concept is the one big idea that accounting's had. It's been around for thousand years probably or more and that's the one big idea accounting's had so we'll look at that big idea that underlies the uh, uh, double entry accounting model that we have in accounting we'll see that and leads to the duality of transactions in accounting the dual effect of everything a firm does in accounting debits and credits we'll see that they're just not meaningless terms but there's <laughs> actually reasons why we're doing all this and so we're looking at the why and the accounting equation, the five elements of accounting. That's all, it's a business model, accounting is a business model, and we just look at those five items. Oh, Maria, is the sound going all right in Mackay? Sound is perfect, thank you, Martin. That's so good. You're sounding good too, Maria, that's fantastic. The five elements of accounting, accounting assets, liabilities, equity, revenue, and expenses. That's all that we look at in accounting. There's a lot else of things going on in a business, but they're the five things we look at. Models simplify reality, and accounting is a simplification of what's going on in a business. But these ideas in accounting, the entity concept, these five elements of accounting and so forth, have turned out to be very powerful ideas. So powerful that we're still using them today, uh, even though everything's been digitised. And so powerful that the big four main accounting firms in the world are four huge companies with $40 billion of revenues of revenue each year. And if you go and look at the CEOs of companies, listed companies, say in Australia and other countries, you see how whack of them have accounting backgrounds on accountants. Raman Healthcare, which is my firm, it has its, its previous CFO is the current chief executive 
and the previous chief executive was the CFO before that. They don't get the guys who are running all the, biz, all the property development and the huge building programs, huge stuff going on there. They don't get the people running the um, aged care centres, the retirement villages. They get the accountant to run the company. So one of the questions you can ask is, why is this? Why is accounting so important if you're on the board of companies or running companies? Why have these ideas been so powerful? That's some of the things we'll look at today. Then we'll have a quick look at some accounting rules. Just a little intro. Accounting has a lot of rules. We'll be looking at accounting standards, accrual accounting. And I think we'll skip the minute paper at this time. So the pre-unit survey, what do you think learning is? Was the question there. And we saw last time we can, we can conceive learning to be a quantitative increase in knowledge. That's the most simple way we can view learning. I just want to chuck stuff in the backpack of a backpack and just accumulate stuff. It's the most simple because there's no idea of what we'll do with it. So it's very simple. It's just collecting quantitative. So it's about quantity. The second, which includes the first, each of these are accumulative, is memorising. So we don't just accumulate this stuff, quantitative increase in knowledge, but we also memorise it so we can reproduce it, say in an assessment, an exam or assignment. The third is the acquisition of facts or methods. This includes the first two, quantitative increase in knowledge, memorising, but this is where we apply it in the real world, say to jobs. You know, I'm going to learn stuff about accounting and I'm going to be able to use it in a job. Those three, if you, and, and we'll look at what you said to those three, those three uh, lead us, to, will inevitably lead us to just surface learning. We'll just want to do it quick. Just give me the stuff, I'll get it, and I'll reproduce the assessment, whatever it is, and we'll get out of here and move on. That sort of very simplistic way of viewing what learning is. The fourth one, which includes the first three, is the abstraction of meaning. It's where I'm in the class, I'm trying to make sense of this for myself. I'm trying to understand what this means in the classroom. And, uh, but it just stays in the classroom. It doesn't get out into the real world. I'm just thinking about it. And then the interpretive process aimed at understanding reality is where I start. includes the other four, but it starts where I, it changes the way I view aspects of the world. Some people in this unit change the way they view aspect of the reason for the seasons. And they start to see that the sun is in a different angle. And that's right. You just change the way you view something in the world. And the fifth it includes all the other five. It's the most complex of learning, and that's changing as a person. So as I change the way I view the world, say the world of business, accounting, whatever it is we're studying, I change as a person. And it can often be in quite significant ways, for good or ill sometimes, depending on what you're learning changing the person. So some people, we'll see what people said. When they're talking about what is learning, I categorise them, and this is sort of broadly it. Around, the first one is, is the uh, quantitative increase in knowledge, around half, and also around 30% with three, the acquisition of facts methods, which includes the other two. And then we had 6% sort of just of, of memorising. It's a little bit more complex than just the first one. So around 80% of people, 85% of people, have that reason, have a reasonably have, have one to three in terms of what they think learning is, conceive learning to be. And that will lead you to rote learn. Because that's what you think learning is. Let's do it efficiently and just get that knowledge in, put it in the backpack and, and, uh, uh, and maybe I'll apply it to, the, to work. Maybe it won't be any use to work. You know? 7% and had the wanting to understand the material for themselves. 1%, 5%, 1 in 6, so around 15%. What we're doing here is just giving you an awareness that there are other ways of thinking about what learning is than perhaps your experience is. And in this unit, you'll have the experience of, you'll have the opportunity to experience learning for understanding as opposed to, that includes rote learning, by the way, it includes remembering it, it includes uh, a quantitative increase in knowledge, you'll know stuff like the five elements of accounting, you'll be able to reproduce them in assessments, and you'll be able to apply them to the world in various ways. But, but you'll get the support to actually understand what it is. 
Why do we do double entry accounting? Why do we have these five elements? What, what's it all about? What sense do I make of it? Why is it important? Is it important? Is it valuable? And, uh, and yes, watch out. Studying accounting can change your life as you can change as a person. What year are you in your studies? 86% odd in first year. First term, we have a few people who started in the previous term, but are still in first year, year two and year three. Year three and four and two percent. So you see mostly first year. Is English your first language? 72% yes, 28% no. About 20, 25% of people in our unit are international students. Some of them are studying online from China and stuff like that and didn't quite make it. But others are coming in, some are on um, some are on isolation as well and doing online. But and we, and but also some of our domestic students, quite a few domestic students do have English as a second language. So it's a wide range of people. And uh, how many units are you studying? 8% one, 2%, 16% two, 11% three, about two thirds, four. Um, if you're studying four and uh, you're also working full time and we've got three kids and doing that time, you really need to think about cutting back two or one. Better to start first term, first year, if you've got a lot of other commitments with a smaller number of units and just settle in. There's a lot to learn. Once you get the idea of how things work, it's much easier, you can reassess. But um, you've got to the beginning of week four to get out of any units if you're in too many. But you've probably got a bit of a feeling by now whether you feel you are overloaded in units given your other commitments. How much time do you expect to spend studying each week? Not to four hours a week, 8%. 5 to 8 hours, 26%, 9 to 11 hours, 43%, 12 plus hours, 23%. Um, the handbook, of course, says 150 hours for every subject. So I suppose people work that out. Over t if it's 15 weeks, that's 10 hours. If it's 12 weeks, it's 12 and a half hours. This unit has been designed so that there is, if you want it, there is 150 hours of learning opportunities. And... Uh, but to get a D or HD, you're probably going to have to do at least around 100, 120 hours to pass around 80 hours. So there's around 25% of people who are planning to spend inadequate time to pass this unit at the moment. And uh, numbers of people plan to just study not every week a unit. Not, not a lot of people do this, but say a quarter. They're only going to study this subject this week or do nothing for a week or two. Um, so that's the sort of thing. And research shows, I've done a little bit of this research, where you ask people this question at the beginning and then you ask them at the end what they actually spend. And what people actually spend is less than what they're expecting. You will, on average, spend less time studying in each unit than you're expecting to. One of the key reasons why those Harvard students don't know anything about science when they get their science degree is inadequate time spent on study. What can you learn about accounting? if you're going to spend 40 hours on it or 50 hours, you'll learn nothing. You'll just work through the assessments. <laughs> That's what you're going to do. And you'll come out and I can ask you on graduation and, you know, I can, I've got a few questions that I have and you won't, you know, you go, well, I don't know. Well, you have the conceptions you had before. But anyway, that's interesting. Um, how much time am I planning to spend? And then when you get to the end, you have a bit of a think about how much time you actually spend. How familiar with Excel are you? Never used it, 4%. Have used it a bit, 43 So there's quite a lot of people who sort of used it a little bit. But you'll find that you've got a, a bit of a learning curve. Quite comfortable, 50%. And an expert, 3%. We have a few experts in the unit. Each time they're great to get to know. They'll be very helpful for you if you get stuck on Excel as well. But we'll be looking at entering data into your spreadsheet. You're able to start doing that now. Now you've got the company. Uh, we'll be linking cells between worksheets. We'll be using simple formulas, plus, minus, that sort of stuff, a sum, and we'll be using uh, some, of the, uh, uh, some of the formulas, NPV, IRR, that sort of thing, out of um, Excel, some of the financial formulas, so that you'll get a little bit of an introduction. And we don't teach Excel, you just learn it by using it. And there's some resources, you'll see in the resources section on Moodle, you have to scroll down to a little bit, there's some resources on how to use Excel, and there's plenty of resources around. So you're getting, so we want everyone to be familiar at a basic level with Excel in first year. 
Obviously, um, almost in any discipline really, but certainly in accounting, obviously employers expect you to be quite, quite familiar with Excel when you graduate. So if you're not too good with it, it won't, it's not a great thing. So that was the pre-unit survey. And, uh, oh, we've got a new Zoom person. But Maria gets onto them and tells me to stop. We've got a few people on Zoom. And we've got, um, we've got Annie. And, uh, hello. And, and oh, Maria, who have we got on Zoom? Maria. We do have Annie. Um, we also have Jack Elliott. We have Anastasia, and I can't see the surname. We have Malky and Ling Dong. And um, with that, uh, and uh, some some are our international students. Uh, there's Milka there. Yep, um, and Emma Rostron. There's a a link up for Emma as well. If uh, international students are attending uh, online, you can you can use the app to. Um, indicate your attendance, and then uh, somehow we'll work that through with the teachers confirming it. Um, but you might be able to discuss that on the Zoom comments, if you, just to get that attendance sorted out. International students, um, uh, we keep track of attendance. Um, double entry accounting, that's what we're going to study. That's accounting. Um, it's a system. It's a system of recording transactions. Transactions, things that occur in the business, of a firm to ensure the relationship between the elements of accounting, which we're going to look at today, between the elements of the business model that underpins accounting is kept intact. We're going to look at that model. We've looked at the fundamental accounting equation that summarises the model. So double entry accounting keeps intact that model as we uh, as we enter in transactions. The reason we do this is not to check for data entry. That's a common misconception. We don't do this, it's hugely complicated double entry accounting. It's a nightmare. I know it's a lot digitised and sorted out now, but it's still a nightmare. And um, we don't do all that just so that we've got some way of checking the data entry. That would be insane. It would be insane on two reasons. One, because it's so complicated. But secondly, it would be insane because it doesn't, it doesn't check most of the data entry issues anyway. So what people are saying when they say it's designed to double to check data entry is the trial balance. Looking at briefly today, you, you set up all the ledger accounts and you see if the debits and credits balance. So if they don't balance, you've obviously got an error, and so you can check it. And that's all good. That picks up some errors, but it doesn't pick up all the errors. It won't pick up an error if you've just inverted the debits and credits around in the transaction the wrong way around. That'll still balance. It won't check it if you put the wrong number in. You know, both places. That won't check it. It won't, it won't uh, pick up a whole range of errors. And uh, if you put them in the wrong accounts, you know, it won't check that out, pick that up. So it, there's a re the reason we do this complex double entry accounting is because of the business model and the entity concept, which we're about to look at. Mm. And it could be a good, it could be a good peer wise question. And uh, that, um, it's all right. Because we've got the Zoom and the and the Echo 360 working together. If Marie just has it, open. if someone has a double open, it can do that. Also, it could be a good peer wise questions. There's been a few on this. You know, why we have double entry accounting, um, all those sorts of you know, and there's an answer actually. So you can make some peer-wise questions. You can even be writing them down, putting them in during class. So if you're a quantitative increase in knowledge person, you can memorize, and a memorized person, you could memorize this, you know. Um, but you probably won't remember it, this stuff. But if you try, but have a go of understanding it, you find the things you understand and are interested in. Quite a few people are interested in accounting even before they start and get interested while we're studying, if you'll find you remember, you'll remember the stuff because you're interested in it and we'll be using it and get some repetitions in it. This is all really good stuff to know in business. So double entry accounting. 
a systematic recording of transactions. It's systematic. There's a system here. It's the reason we're doing it is largely an historical accident, as we discussed in the in the study data. It's, we have a lot of these going on in the world. The keyboard is an historical accident. We wouldn't do it this way if we started from scratch with a computer. It's this way because they used to have typewriters. With things. You know the story from there. If you go into an aeroplane, a jet, the pilot is always on the left. You ever notice that? Why is that? Why aren't on the right? You know, one's always on the left. That's because when the plane started, they had a propeller in the front. And the propeller was going, I think, anti-clockwise. And if you, if you put the, pers the pilot on the left-hand side of the thing, that balanced everything out better than if you sort of got it on this side. Well, the propeller's not there anymore in the front, but we still have the pilot on the left. The buttons, men's and women's buttons are around different ways. Men's are on the, around on the right, aren't we? And left. There's a whole historical reason that. We could go on and on. Counting's like that. That's the reason we have it, because it was developed when we didn't have computers. But we still do it. And uh, journals, ledgers, that's covered in the readings too. Journals is where we enter the transactions in every day. Journalists, they're the people who write newspapers each day. That was the origin of it. And the, and the, I give you the Latin and French words behind it. So the journals, that's where we put the transactions in each day. So this is all automated when you're putting it in. And then that's transferred to the ledgers. Of days you'd have another book, and the ledgers is the is the is where all those transactions are put into the accounts of each type of asset, uh, each of the five elements. And the trial balance is a list of all the ledger accounts balances at the end of the period, and it's it's done to check to to see if they all balance. Get a bit of a look at it. Once we've got to the trial balance, that's the end of the bookkeeping phase, if you like, of accounting. Then they go into looking at the accounting role, which is looking at the financial statements, what are these, and, and turn them into reports of various types, management accounting, and so that we can use these numbers to connect to the business. So that's all in the readings. The, uh, we do expect everyone to do the readings. And uh, the entity concept, this is the big concept in accounting. This is the one big idea. We don't know who came up with it, but someone did a long time. The entity concept. This is an awareness of the owner or proprietor of a business who is separate and distinct from the business itself. We say, well, what's the big deal about that? You know, But in the old days, if you like, if it was Fred Smith, the blacksmith, had his business, people just saw Fred and the business as the same thing. Just it wasn't like a business or anything. But accounting conceives the business as being separate. This led to um, companies being created as legal economic entities. Positive, sorry. And um, as legal. <sighs> well done. And so that idea was taken into the law. So the companies are actually legal, separate legal entities. Is that him? Looking straight at you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm stuffed up. That's what I've done. Karen in, in Cairns. Yeah, just turn the mic off. That's the most important thing, Karen. Martin, we've just lost. Um, it's Maria and Mackay. So we've. Just Lost, I've lost Zoom connection and I've also lost your slides. So we can see you, um, but no, no slides, and I'm just trying to get into Zoom again now. All right, let's set it all up again. I think Karen has done something very bad there. She pressed some button. All right, you get the Zoom back in. Yes, yeah, so the, the legal creation of companies as a separate legal entity they have their legal entity, they can be taxed, they can do all sorts of things. Separate legal entity, that came out of accounting, that idea. But one good idea, one big idea of accounting. But accounting, it also applies to sole traders, to partnerships, to other forms of business that are not separate legal entities. Accounting treats them as separate to the owner. And so we also have separate records for the owner and the business. You don't mix them up. 
Sometimes people do that when they start up a business, but they quickly realise that's not a good idea. So that's the entity concept. It's an awareness. It's the way we think about it. Most of what well, we generally naturally think about it now, but that's because of accounting. Accounting has been a very powerful influence on business. One of them has been we think of businesses as being separate to the owners. And what this means in accounting is that everything a firm does, every transaction, has a dual aspect. Just as a coin has two sides, or an argument has two sides, usually, and there are two sides of a piece of paper, every transaction in a firm has two elements, two aspects to it, a dual aspect. So we conceive in accounting that everything a firm does affects the firm and its owners and nobody else. But of course, that's sort of lost track of how we see businesses increasingly. We see businesses as having impacts on the environment, on the general community. And so there's been a broad, you know, a broader view, but accounting doesn't take any account of that. It just looks at everything a firm is doing as affecting the firm and its owner. And a business, so a business, every time you do a transaction, we must make at least two changes in its assets, liabilities or equity when it records each transaction. And we see that revenue and expense accounts are temporary accounts, which we then, then um, uh, clean out, clear out into equity at the end of a period. So that's why we do double entry accounting. That's why we do it twice. That's the thinking behind it. Now debits and credits. Where did they come from? Who came up with this idea? Well, the debit is from the Latin, the beer, to owe. The I, and the credit is the, credit is the Latin credia, which means to believe or to entrust. So when we increase an asset, it's a debit because we owe, the firm owes an obligation to the owners to manage the asset well and provide a return on it for the owners. That was the idea. The firm hasn't created the asset itself. It's, been, it's got an obligation to the owners to manage that asset well, to the owners who own it. And if you increase equity or liability, it's a credit. And that's because someone outside the firm has entrusted or believed in the firm. My youngest son, when he was five actually, he bought shares in Raman Healthcare when it floated in July 1999. He's now 26. He was emailing me, yes, he was sort of emailing, I think, or messaging me yesterday saying, should I buy some more shares? You know, and I see they've gone down. The, um, good idea. Good idea. But the five he bought into, he, he gave his entire life savings. He was too young to realise. He only had, he had $500. Where did this $500 come from? From the grandparents, they obviously kept in bits of money and we just were putting into his account. So I said, right, put all that in. The other two children had $900. They put all of, all their monies in. I topped up four, to, so he's got the 900, been five. The other, my daughter, she was nine. She was not too happy about putting her entire life savings into this. But they're entrusting the firm with the money and she's saying, what, what if I lose it all? You know. So you see the owners are entrusting the business with like real moolah. <laughs> And so I said, trust me, it'll be okay. She looks at me like, oh, are you sure about this? And, uh, but I topped them up $2 for one. So they bought $2,700 worth of shares. They put in 900, I put in 1800. I figured even if it didn't go too well, they would still not lose money. I wanted them to get some experience through their teens of investing rather than simply consuming. We get plenty of experience of consuming. How about the idea of investing? And, um, and my younger son, he seems to have learned some of the things, because now he's thinking about perhaps investing in the downturn. There's some good buys out there in the share market. And so that's the idea of the, the crediting, the li equity and liability. Someone outside the firm has entrusted the firm. And the assets is, is a debit because we have, um, we owe, the firm owes an obligation. And so there's this mutual trust relationship between the owner and the firm. This is how accounting conceives it. 
by thinking the firm is separate to the owners, there's a trust relationship between them. If you've ever been involved in businesses, you quickly realise there's trust relationships in business. The global financial crisis, 2008, which just destroyed a lot of people <laughs> financially, still got a lot of effects today, was because the banks stopped trusting each other. They couldn't lend to each other. The whole thing gummed up because they didn't know they, all this bad stuff floating around in the financial markets there in terms of mortgage bank securities and other things. They didn't know what the financial position of these banks were, so they just stopped lending to each other. They didn't trust. Lack of trust, the whole thing collapsed. So all our markets, all our businesses, there's, an, there's trust relationships, just as we have in all relationships, there's trust. And accounting in business, we want to trust within boundaries, you know. <laughs> but the, you know, there's trust relationships, and that's what debits and credits are recognising. The five elements of accounting. Our way of viewing business in accounting is is summarised in these five elements. We view a firm as having these five key elements and nothing else. Assets, liabilities, equity, revenue, expenses. These are the five elements. Write them down, five, write them down 40 times to remember them for the rest of your life. Equity, assets, liabilities, equity, revenue, expenses. Now, assets. You see it in the reading. You've got to do the readings every week. We assume you do them. We don't go through everything in the classes. The elements of accounting. Assets is a present economic resource. That's what an asset is. It's a present economic resource that is controlled by a firm. It's important to control it because you're going to get benefits out in the future. This You've got to control it or someone else will take them. A present economic resource controlled by a firm that has the potential. It has the potential to produce economic benefits. I may not come, but it's got the potential. That is, has the potential to add value to a firm in the future. This is what an asset is. A present, it's in the present, a present economic resource. In the reading, we talked about Coffee Supreme's delivery vans. These silver delivery vans they've got. They have the potential, to, they're an asset of the firm, Coffee Supreme. They have the potential to produce economic benefits to Coffee Supreme by transporting its products to customers in the future. So it's an asset. You need to understand these definitions. And uh, if you understand them, you'll remember them fine. But that's up to you how you go about it. Liabilities, a present obligation of a firm to transform, transfer an economic resource that a firm has no practical ability to avoid. So it's in the present, just like an asset's in the present. It's a present obligation for a firm to transfer an economic resource the firm has no practical ability to avoid. For example, Coffee Supreme may have promised to pay $50,000 in two months to a firm in Brazil that has recently supplied it with raw materials. It doesn't have to be a legal obligation. You can just, you just, you've got no practical ability to avoid it. You might, for a range of reasons, it could be through various business practices and other reasons. And equity are the claims of the owners in a business. It's the value of the interests of the owners in a business. It's based on our view of business reality. Based on our view of business reality, equity will always equal assets, less liabilities. If we viewed business differently, there could be different relationships. And that's certainly something that's developing in the world of accounting. But as we view that business model, equity will always equal assets less liabilities. Because all we're worried about is the firm and its owners. The firm is the assets and liabilities and the equity is the owners. Now, revenue. There's a fourth element, revenue. So we have assets, liabilities and equity. You'll see them in your firm's balance sheet. We have revenue. Revenue are increases in assets or decreases in liabilities of a firm that results in increases in equity, other than those relating to contributions from equity investors. When my children bought $2,700 worth of shares in Roman Healthcare in July 1999, they put their money, it's all done electronically, but they put their money to the company and it got $2,700 in its cash and bank account when it was issuing new shares. So it increased its cash account. 
But that didn't add value. That wasn't a revenue item because it came from, it was a contribution from the equity investors. So it's increases in assets or decreases in liabilities of the firm that result in increases in equity other than those relating to contributions from equity investors. So when my children paid their $2,700, I went to the company, their, their asset cash went up $2,700. Would that be a debit or a credit? That would be a debit. Increase in assets, a debit. And their equity went up $2,700. Uh, Ryman Healthcare raised some equity. Um, I think it was about $25 million, I think, or $15 million total. They raised some equity, and that's um, increased their equity. So that's what revenue is. And expenses are decreases in assets or increases in liabilities, so it's the reverse, of a firm that results in decreases in equity, other than those relating to distributions to equity investors. Ryman Healthcare pays out $100 million or whatever it is each year by dividends to its shareholders. That would, that would um, decrease its assets, cash, actually increases its liabilities so it borrows to pay for its dividends, increases its liabilities and would decrease its equity. When it pays a dividend, that decreases its equity. So when it pays a dividend, that would decrease its equity, which would actually be a debit because an increase in equity is a credit. So these are changes in value. Revenue expenses are a change in value in the firm. When a when a, a investor, when an equity investor, or if there's transfers between um, the the shareholders between a firm, they're not adding value because it's just like my kids are giving the firm two thousand seven hundred. Well, they they're now they've now lost all their life savings. You know, they've gone down two thousand seven hundred, and it's gone up in the company, but that just evens out amongst the owners and the shareholders. But revenue expenses are changes in value. Business is about value creation or destruction. This is what values are. Business is about trust and building, you know, a lot of things in business, but it's fundamentally about adding value. Most of the things we have, a, we have most of our economy is, 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 and most of the things we're getting are from private companies and businesses. Most of the services and products. They're creating value. Ryman Healthcare started with nothing. It was nothing in 1985. It's now got thousands of people in retirement villages that it's looking after, and, and thousands more relatives who are feeling much more comfortable with the relationship. Thousands of staff. Man, it's created something. It's created value that people are valuing. So that's what businesses are doing. It's about changes in value. Some businesses destroy value too, funny that. But the, the great businesses are creating a lot of value. And that's the revenue expenses. Now we summarise the model, the accounting model, with the accounting equation. The simplest accounting equation is equity equals assets less liabilities. So you can see that equity, that's the owner, and the assets and liabilities is the business, and they equal. That's what the model says. Because everything a firm does affects just itself and the owners. You might remember a while ago, BP, they had a problem in the Gulf of Mexico with, a, with one of their uh, oil rigs just went, oh, and it just poured out all this oil for quite a long time. It was all on TV. It was a few years ago. Man, it was the first time I'd seen all this stuff. It just caused all this mayhem around, destroyed the fishing, caused all this oil everywhere, a huge mess. And a lot of political problems, even between the UK and, and the US. Barack Obama was the president of times, very much, you know. And uh, so things firms do, do affect more than themselves and the owners. Well, that affects a lot of stuff. But, and, um, and it, but we don't look at that. We look at only the extent to which, and that did affect the owners as well. They had to pay out a lot of money and all sorts of stuff, and it damaged their business a bit. But that's all we record here. What affects the firm and the owners? Equity because assets minus liabilities. Increase in equity, credit. Increase in assets and liabilities, debit. Credit means that um, that uh, 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 asset. Uh, uh, no, I won't go through that again. Assets, but we can rearrange it into assets equals equity plus liabilities. That's just a simple rearrangement of that equation, and we often do it that way. 
assets equals equity plus liability. The reason we do that, um, I will get to that. Assets equals equity plus, you can express it either way. And that's the entity concept or the duality of all our transactions is summarised in that equation. Now we can extend it, the extended accounting equation. We can add in the revenue and expenses. These are the five elements. And we can express it like this. Assets equals equity plus revenue minus expenses plus liabilities. The revenue and expenses are changes to equity. How do we know that? We just did the definition of it. That's what it says. These are changes, they're temporary accounts. So instead of changing equity directly every time we do we have you know, we get some revenue expenses, we put them in the revenue expenses accounts during the period, they're temporary accounts. And you can um, the reason we do that is we can calculate the profit at the end of the period. Profit equals revenue less expenses. So what happens is at the beginning of the, we we accumulate all the revenue expenses during the period, we um, transfer them all to a profit and loss account at the end of the period. We calculate our profit or loss. Profits are good, losses are not so good. And then we transfer the profit to equity at the end of the period. And then when we start the next period, the revenue expenses accounts are all empty. They've got nothing in them, they're zero. They're temporary accounts just for the period and then they start again. Whereas the assets, equity and liabilities accounts go on. Their balances just keep going on. And we often express the extended fundamental accounting equation as assets plus expenses equals equity plus revenue plus liabilities. Why might we do this? Well, the reason we do it is increases in assets and expenses are debits. Increases in equity, revenue and liabilities are credits. So if you memorise the assets plus expenses equals equity plus revenue plus liabilities, you can memorise it by writing it down 40 times. You can do it eight times a day over five days. You can just go cold turkey, write up 40 times. And with occasional repetitions, which you'll certainly get in this unit and through the rest of your business career, you'll never forget it. You'll never forget it. Virtually nobody will do that in this unit. They won't write it down 40 times. Virtually no one. There'll be a few, but they're virtually no one. It's that simple to know the fundamental accounting equation. And it can also help you to know where the debits and credits lie. Assets are plus expenses. Increasing that are debits on the other side there. Credits. You can write it. You can write it five times or eight times just during class. The um, I used to do this sort of thing when I was studying undergrad accounting and other things. You know, we'd go skiing at the Threadbar and places like this, and up in the, at the ski lifts, it'd be queues. You know, be queues. And so I'm writing down you know the fundamental mechanical <laughs> While I'm waiting, you know, or whatever. And friends are going, Martin, what are you doing? What are you doing? I'm saying, I'm writing fundamental accounting equations. And they go, man, are you crazy? Are you nuts? You know? Well, no, I thought this was important. I knew all this stuff. I knew that you needed to know some of this stuff in business. I've been on boards of lots of companies. I've chaired lots of companies. I've been on a lot of boards. And you always need a few accountants, at least somebody there. A lot of them, they're marketing other people. They don't know anything about accounting. They probably did first year accounting like this and can't remember anything about it. But... But, you know, they present all these numbers and, and accounts and stuff. You've got to interrogate it. We'll be talking a bit about that later in the term. You've got to be able to understand how it got put together. This is important in business. It's part of the skill set. There are other things in business that are very important, but accounting is one of them. There's a reason why so many people running businesses, so many directors of companies have accounting backgrounds. There's a reason. And if you can find the answer to that, Reason, understand the reason for that, that's probably a very good take out from this unit. If you understand the importance of that, you'll make the effort to get a bit of a foundation. Just as you study all the disciplines in your first year, in Bachelor of Accounting, Bachelor of Business, each of them are important and they all, all interact, interact. So I said that increases in assets and expenses is a debit and increases in equity and revenue is a credit. Well, that's the model. Now, 
there are also some account. There's a lot of rules in accounting. A lot of rules. You'll see that already. One of the areas is accounting standards. We have the Australian Accounting Standards Board, IASB. There's been a few questions on that already in PYs. And the International Financial Reporting Standards, IF, IFRS. Over 100 countries in the world uh, subscribe to the International Accounting Standards. Almost you know, great whack of the economy. The main company, country that doesn't ha has its own separate standards is the US. There's a couple other countries as well. US, they have concern. They their their accounting standards are more black letter. They have much. They have more rules and they're clearer cut. The international accounting standards have a lot more judgments, and the accounting standards, the, the FASB, the Accounting Standards Board in the US, it doesn't want to go into the international accounting standards because of all those judgments, and we'll be seeing some of that as we study. For those studying accounting, you'll definitely see a lot of that as we go through the degree. But for Australia and most countries of the world, um, they're using international accounting standards. There's, that's the International Financial Reporting Standards, or International Accounting Standards, and they're set by the International Accounting Standards Board, IASB. They set the accounting standards, and they keep changing over time. So for those studying accounting, you'll learn certain things yeah, but that'll change over time. So you have to understand, that's where you've got to understand what you're doing. You don't just memorise stuff, it's shifting and you've got to apply it to the real world. You need to know what you're doing. The International Financial Reporting Standards, then the Australian Accounting Standards Boards applies them, to, adapts and applies them to Australia. We have a different legal system to other countries. Um, for those who have uh, um, companies that are in other countries, they're all... In, in this unit. They're all following the same accounting standards in Australia, but they have different legal environments. So there's a couple of little differences in how they, what they have to conform to. And so that's how the accounting standards work. They get set internationally, it's based in London, and then the Australian Accounting Standard Boards adapt, supplies them to Australia. Um, and there's a, a sort of web of legal and other reasons that make them compulsory. In Australia, the business the, every company is required to do it under the Corporations Act, um, but there's a whole lot of other things that cover all the other business entities. So there's a sort of web that's discussed a bit in the reading. And the Australian Securities and Investment Commission, ASIC, it enforces the Corporations Act, it enforces a lot of these rules. So um, if people are breaching them, ASIC might be knocking on your door. If you're a, if you're a um, listed company, have a look. that's on the next slide. If you're a listed company, the Australian Securities Exchanges in Australia or whatever your security exchange is in the country, they will also require you to follow the accounting standards. So all of our companies are listed companies. So if they start to breach the accounting standard rules, the stock exchange will be all over them and ASIC will be all over them, it won't be good. So people stick to the rules. Also, the, the professional accounting bodies, CPA Australia, the Institute of, um, the, in Zika, the Institute of Chartered Accountants, that's not quite right. The Institute of Chartered Accountants in New Zealand and Australia, and the Institute of Public Accountants, there are three main ones here, but particularly the, the Chartered Accountants and the CPA, they, um, if you're a member, if you're an accountant and a member of those professional bodies, you have to conform to the accounting standards um, as is required by your membership. Now, the Bachelor of Accounting, if you do the Bachelor of Accounting, you'll meet the academic requirements for membership of the CPA and the Chartered Accountants, the Institute of Chartered Accountants. And, um, and so then, and then you do um, sort of further professional work with them and, and you have to work for a few years to get full membership. You can be a student member of those bodies now. I strongly advise you to do that. There's the links to the um, membership and to, the, uh, in, to those two, CPA and the and Institute of Chartered Accounts Australia and New Zealand, you can um, 
go to their websites and join as a student member. Then you'll get various bits and pieces from them. You get access to all sorts of information. You can just get a feel for how the professional bodies work. And uh, uh, for those doing accounting too, we tend to get the professional bodies to visit us and do those things with us through the degree. Um, if you're doing the accounting major in the Bachelor of Business, which some people are doing, um, that's not accredited with the professional bodies. That's for people who don't want to be accountants, but want to just have, which is important. You need a bit of background in accounting, but you're not planning to be a, um, an accountant or want to join the professional bodies. But uh, if you are doing the major in accounting in the Bachelor of Business, you need to think about whether you want to join a professional body or not or have that option. If you do, you need to switch to the Bachelor of Accounting. You can do Bachelor of Accounting with a management major. That's very similar to doing a Bachelor of Business with an accounting major, except it's accredited. So that's something to think about in first year. Quite a few people get that sorted out in first year. And the other thing in a, with the accounting standards and the rules is the concept of a reporting entity. A number of people told me in their step one that they were very surprised that um, you know in the late 19th century or whatever, um, account financial stamps accounts were private. They weren't going to give them out to anyone. It's sort of like our own personal you know financial. We don't go around putting on Facebook. Oh, I've got you know whatever. You don't, you don't, we're letting, it wouldn't be well regarded. And uh, companies were like that themselves. That was all private. So people were surprised at that. But now. There are a lot of rules for getting uh, where companies and businesses need to comply to produce accounts for the general public. And uh, there's this concept of reporting entity. There's some other aspects to it that's in the reading. But if you're, if you're required to, um, or if you do, produce your financial statements to the general public, you need to conform to the account. So all businesses in Australia, pretty well, basically this is true, all business Australia are required to conform to the accounting standards, but does that mean that they all do? If every, you just think about it, we've got so many businesses, these sole traders, partnerships and companies, all sorts of things, private companies, there's millions of businesses. Just walking around your poon, there's millions of businesses. There's businesses everywhere. Do they all have to conform to the accounting standards? Well, the answer is not, they don't. Most of them don't. The reason for that is they are not producing general purpose financial reports. They're not required to as reporting entities or whatever, and they don't have to conform to accounting standards. So most businesses don't have to do that. If everybody had to report to accounting standards, there'd be so much work for accounts, it wouldn't be funny. So if you haven't read the chapter, you need to read chapter two to understand where these rules apply and who has to follow them. So if you're just doing your accounts for tax purposes and stuff, it's all internal, you don't have to follow accounting standards. And uh, some do to some extent, some don't. But if you're general purpose financial reporting, which is what we focus on, you have to conform to the accounting standards. If you don't, you end up in the white collar crime wing of some prison somewhere in West Africa. So accounting has a lot of rules in accounting standards. And we've just gone very briefly over how that sort of works broadly. But there are also principles and sort of um, ideas in accounting. One is the matching principle. <coughs> the matching principle. Some people think, man, is, do I have to match my socks in the morning? What is this? The matching principle. Now, to, we're interested in value add in business. To determine the net profit of a business in a period, a business calculates the expenses involved in earnings, earning the revenues of the period and, and deducts the total expenses from the total revenues earned in that period. That is, it matches its expenses against revenues. It's calculating its profit in a period. The reason we do that is um, we could just wait for the firm to do its whole life. No, we'll just wait. But some firms might take 100 years, or they might go on for a long time. 
what we want to know, we want to know, generally, invariably, we want to know how a firm's going in a period of time along the way. We don't want to wait. Some firms, like BHP and you know, Tim, but say BHP Billiton, it's gone on for like since the 1850s. You'll be, that's 150, 70 years. Man, you'll be dead before they, they never know what they're doing. So we want to know over a period. If we want to know the profit and the performance over a period of time, within that period, we're going to need to make sure that the revenue and expenses match, that the, the, that the, we include the revenue in a period and the expenses that were incurred to generate that revenue in the same period. Otherwise, we're not going to get a good profit figure. So that's the matching principle. That's what, that's something that firms will certainly, anyway, that that's, firms will apply. Now, in, for the matching principle, we have accrual accounting. Now, this bit's important. If you if you if you're watching on video, I'd you know watch this bit particularly. The um, and just this is the bit to take out in this class. Accrual accounting is when we record transactions and economic events in a firm's accounts when their economic substance occurs. And this may be different, it often is, this may be different to when cash changes hands. So the reason we do that is we record these transactions and economic events in the accounts when the economic substance occurs because we're going to be wanting to match the revenue and expenses in a period. So this is a fundamental principle underlying accounting. If you don't know about accrual accounting, you know nothing about accounting. If I go up on graduation and ask you what accrual accounting is, and you go and tell me something. Like those Harvard people, I know many don't know nothing about accounting. Those Harvard people know nothing about astronomy and the solar system. <laughs> they know nothing. I know the same thing. This is important, and it's sort of just, you can memorise this definition, but that doesn't really cut it. You've got to understand what this concept of accrual accounting is. That's what you want to come away with from this week. It's a key idea, a key principle underlying accounting. People who know nothing about accounting think we record everything when the cash changes hands. Most people think accounting is cash-based. Accounting records transactions when their economic substance occurs. There's quite a few little things around that, but that's the fundamental accrual. Accounting it uses accrual accounting. There's a lot of little wrinkles around that, but that's the fundamental principle. We'll be looking at that sort of thing quite a lot this term. And the key thing about this, when cash changes hands is clear cut. That's so obvious. When the economic substance of a transaction occurs, that's not so obvious. It requires judgments. Judgments. What do judgments mean? They mean that different people will make different judgments. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a judgment. There's some subjective element to this. You've got to make a judgment. Some people will be better at making those judgments than others. Some people may make the judgments to make the accounts look good. So they might deliberately do some poor judgments. Or you might make some poor judgments just through not being too good at it. So accrual accounting is one of the reasons why we have, uh, where we have to, where we record transactions when the economic substance occurs, which requires, can require judgments. And there's some examples of that in the reading, uh, you know, with me catching the bus and stuff. The reason we have accrual accounting, why do we go all this hassle of recording transactions when the economic substance occurs? Because we want to know the value add or the profit or the performance of a firm in a period. That's why we do it all. Why do we want to know that? We don't want to wait for the life of the whole firm. We want to know as we go. I catch the bus to your poon. This is out of the reading. I catch the bus to your poon. And, um, you know, it, 
and I, I get on the bus and then I swipe my little easy travel card. This one like that. And uh, every so often I put 50 bucks on it and, and I just put this one there. When does the firm recognise its revenue? When does Young's Buses recognise its revenue? Does it recognise the revenue when the cash changes hands? When I give them 50 bucks? I give them 50 bucks and swipe it all. Goes into their bank account. Not automatically on a bus, I don't think. I think they have to take the till. I, I don't know, maybe this all records through to the account straight up. Maybe it does. Possibly it does. The old days, they take the till in, you know. If that cash goes straight into their bank account, to their cash account. 50 bucks. The cash has changed hands. I haven't got it anymore. They have. Is that when they record the revenue? $50. It goes on the card. And then I go along, and then I just swipe it along like this. And, and the bus driver smiles nicely and I, go on, and I hop on the bus and then it takes me up. Sometimes it just drops off here, you know, in the car park and I can hop off and walk across. When does the firm recognise the revenue? When does the economic substance of that transaction occur? Well, it's not when I give the 50 bucks. When I've given the 50 bucks, they haven't given me any trips. I've just given them 50 bucks. I, they have to give me some trips. And so when they, then I go on and I swipe the car and no cash has changed this time. I hop on the bus and it takes me down here and I get off. Well, that's when the economic substance of the transaction has occurred. They've given me the trip I've got here. And they've used the salaries of the bus driver, the bit of wear and tear on the bus and the tyres, and, and they've used those expenses. That's when the economic substance of the revenue has occurred. So each time I swipe the card. When does Young Buses record its revenue? How does it do that? But that's the concept of accrual accounting. And if you understand that, then uh, you understand quite a bit about accounting. But you have to think about it. Do you just want to, uh, you, are you just um, accumulating facts and knowledge and put it in your backpack, or you could sort of write that definition down. But if you don't understand it, if it doesn't mean anything, you won't remember it anyway. And But uh, but if you take a bit of time to understand these, and it will take a bit of time to get these concepts, they'll stay with you forever, and then you'll change the way you view the accounts, anything you look at, you'll just understand that that's how it's done. And you'll, be, you'll have that skill set. You don't need to be an accountant. You can be in any area of business, but you, this is a fundamental principle. It's worthwhile understanding. And planning. Planning and time management are key to success in this unit. A number of people have been commenting on that in their step one. Man, you know, some people are so organised. There are some people so organised. Man, they were looking up the unit profile three weeks before term started, and that's when the unit profiles come out. I even sometimes, some one or two people even email me asking me something about the unit profile three weeks out. I think, man, you guys are organised. Two weeks, the Moodle sites go out. This happens every unit, every term. Two units go out. Man, some people straight on the Moodle site two weeks. They've got the weekly schedule. They've got the assessment design. They're planning everything. They're seeing what everything is. Yeah, looking at the rest of their lives. They're going, man, these people are so organised. Bang, bang, bang. And so those people, they tend to do really well in this year. <laughs> they're so organised because there's deadlines. It's here, it's there. It's just chunk, chunk, chunk. And they're just working away. They know what they're doing this weekend. They've got this plan here. And there. They, they invariably do really, they do perfectly well in this unit. It's a key to success in this unit. I had, that I had planned my study routine and putting aside time on the weekend to work out how and when I should start attacking the assignments and other assessments. Some people decide, I better, better get some planning going on here. I better set aside some time. When all these things due and how does it fit in with all my other subjects? <coughs> my co-worker studies with me and on Monday we were both feeling overwhelmed. Quite a few people have felt overwhelmed. They started in like, man, what's this? So much stuff. And just uni generally. Overwhelmed. So we sat down and worked out what we had to do. And when it was due. And we both felt much better about it. I learned this when I was at uni too. It took me a few years. Being planned and organised is so good. I used to think, I don't want to be planned and organised. I want to be a free agent. I just want to just sort of wing it. You know? 
and I, and I, I, after a few, I realised it is so freeing to be organised. I'm doing all sorts of things. It might surprise you. I do more than this subject, you know, just as you're doing more subject. I've got all sorts of things doing. All sorts of things going on, and family and other things, and names, and all of that. Just like everybody else. But if you've got it all planned, you know, got various, it's all thought. I don't have to worry about stuff. I know it's all. I won't forget this when it comes up. I've got. I know I've got to do these things this week for this over there. It just frees you up. When I learnt that lesson, it took me a while. <laughs> that has been so helpful. So you get a little bit of an opportunity to develop your time management and planning skills in this unit. You've got all the deadlines for everything in detail, uh, and you can just follow that and plan your time around your other commitments. If you do that and realise you haven't got enough time to do this <laughs> or do all your subjects, you need to get out of one or more of your subjects while you can, you know, before paying fees and before failure, and just sort of work your way through. Everything becomes much more fun. Learning, real learning, active learning, learning that will change your life or change the way you view the world, that sort of learning takes time. It takes mental energy. And it's fun. Once you, if you're doing something you enjoy, if you're interested in business, okay, it's great fun. But it takes time. If you haven't got the time, if you're busy racing around doing other stuff and you're trying to slot things in, you won't be doing real learning. You'll be doing the pretend learning. And the pretend learning can get you to a degree you can get degrees, but it won't be any good to you when you start work. <laughs> what do they want? Once you've got your job, grades can help you get the job. That was my experience too. They get your job. But once you've got the job, like whatever grades you've got, and some people get great grades. I had better ones. I had such good grades. I, had, I just had the grades. I was so good. I had nutted out this system at university so well where I was at it. I just killed it. You know. But... Once I started work, from the day I started work, no one has ever asked me what my grades are. Not once. Uh, having the degrees, I've got five degrees actually. I've got lots of degrees. That's, you still put, that's still important. They've never asked me. What have they been interested in from the first day I started? I started an investment bank and in merchant acquisitions. What was the first thing? What have they been interested in? Not my grades. I can care less about grades. They're interested in my personal qualities and what I can do. That's what they're interested in. When I'm teaching this subject, I turn up here. You aren't interested in my grades. I could tell you all my grades. They're so good. But you don't care. You care about personal qualities and what can I do? Am I any good as a lecturer? And you know, the staff any good at this course? That's what you're interested in. So you, that's what's going to count once you start work. So do both. You can get good grades. You certainly want to pass. And getting good grades will help you get a job. A lot of our students end up in jobs while they're studying, in accounting particularly. Everybody's got a job. You don't need to worry. You've got a job. The focus also on developing your personal qualities and, and, um, and um, what, you know, you know, what you can do. Communication online is going to be critical. Here's some time to practice it in this particular unit. Also, being able to learn, being able to actually learn properly and get on top of new things is going to be critical to your life, obviously. It's changing so much. The coronavirus is an example of that. It's a big change at the moment. Some people are coping with it much better than others. Some people have got much better mechanisms to be able to shift with quick changes and adjust and learn how you have to do things. That's a constant thing. You've got a chance to learn a bit about that in this unit. And accounting, accounting is just so great. You've got a great chance to get a grip on the fundamentals of accounting in this unit, which will stand you in good stead throughout your business careers, whatever you do. Time management, I'd encourage you to get into that. I was not a fan of it when I was early in university, I think, but I changed my mind after a few years, and it's been great. So what have we done? We did the pre-unit survey. I gave you a little bit of feedback on what people said. And I do read through everything. I just sort of sit on the bus, you know, while I'm pondering when the revenue is being recognised by Young's buses. Oh, I just read everyone's comments, it's very interesting. And I've done this for years and years and years. I've heard lots of people's comments and different things, it's most interesting. And you've got a little, I gave you a little bit of figures about the background of people in our unit. There's 368 people over in our unit. They're incredibly interesting. I can tell you that because I'm engaging with all these people. So good, you can connect with these people. Find some people to connect to, lots of, and that's where you do most of your learning. 
We looked at a way of viewing business. That is what accounting is. It's a way of viewing business. As it's turned out, it's a very powerful way of doing it. That's why accounting is such a big deal <laughs> in, in the world of economy and business. It's a big deal. And the reason for that is, these are, is that it's been a really valuable model. And we still do it even though it's been digitally disrupted, the accounting profession, more than any other profession. The fundamental ideas are still there, even though the books are gone. We looked at the double entry accounting. We looked at why we put in everything twice. So it's good to know why we do all this, particularly those who major in accounting will be doing a lot of this sort of stuff. Why are we doing it? The entity concept, the key idea underlying accounting, the one good idea accounting's had is this, that the firm is separate to the owners and that everything a firm does affects just the firm and its owners and nobody else. There are some problems with that model. We're viewing business quite differently in the last 50 years, so accounting's got to sort of figure that out and it's, that's a challenge. But that's how accounting is at present. The duality, there's a dual effect of transactions. Because we view everything is affecting the firm and the owners, we have to put in a transaction in twice. Because every transaction, the model we've got, every transaction has two effects. It doesn't just have one effect, it has two effects on the firm and on the owner. In reality, of course, transactions have more than two effects. They might be affecting the environment, for example, but we don't worry about that. It might be affecting the staff, it might be affecting the community in various ways, but we don't have any inclusion of that in the accounts. We looked at debits and credits. We found out that debits and credits are not meaningless. Debits and credits actually came from somewhere. They weren't just sort of created out of the blue by some vindictive person. Debits and credits, debits de beer, credits credit. The debits means to, at the, um, to uh, um, oh, sorry, debits means to owe, to owe an obligation. The firm owes an obligation to the owners. That's why we debit an asset. The firm has an obligation, like Ryman's has an obligation to the owners, like my kids, to um, manage the assets it has well and generate value for the owners. My children are trusting them to do it. And that's where credit, the credit comes in. My children have trusted them with their own resources, with the firm, um, and, uh, and that's represented by the equity. Credit, debits and credits. You can spend a little bit of time just understanding that. You'll be streets ahead of almost everyone in business when you know that. And the accounting equation, the five elements of accounting, that summarises the business model. Again, it's not just meaningless stuff. There's the model, the way we view business and accounting. It's a way of viewing business that's well worth understanding and getting into, which is what we're doing this term because it's turned out to be a very powerful way of doing business. I found that as well in my career. It's a very powerful way, so it's a good, it's a good way of figuring out business, of looking at business. It doesn't include everything of business though. And we looked at accounting rules just very briefly. There are a lot of accounting rules. Some of them are written like the accounting standards and, and uh, there's a whole mixed mash of ways of why people have to conform to them or not. And we, that's in the reading. And then we looked at the principle, the matching principle, and then the principle of accrual accounting, which underlies everything. Accounting is not based on cash. Maria may love the cash flow statement, but accounting is not based on cash. It's based on accrual accounting. We record transactions when their economic substance occurs, which may be at different times to cash. So that's what we did. We just did a full on lot of me. Um, but we'll be doing more interaction next week. Um, the, uh, so thank you very much, everyone. We can go to our, our uh, other classes now. And um, the, uh, I'll keep in touch with everyone. Regardless of what happens with, you know, things shutting down with the coronavirus sort of stuff over time, this class will continue on as it is, either online, however it is, that whole subject will just continue on. If you can't end up coming to class for whatever reason, you can participate, Zoom online and everything else. It'll all just continue on. Well, thank you very much. Bye for now.